Timbres, acabat. The bell rings and playground is over. So we shall get started today. Welcome to you all to this fifth edition of the Cosmograph project, which uh, begins with Marina Garcés and Xavier Vall, who will introduce her. I am pleased to thank uh, her presence today and it's wonderful today to think about education so that we can think this education this is such a basic important topic uh, this uh, collective of the school of journalists and the group of the center of catalonia the school of uh, architects amongst many other associations uh, well, it's wonderful to to see you all here and we understand that it's complex and this uh, topic, uh, we, we thought it was um, whether it should be think to educate or educate to think. There is a reflection behind it. Uh, this is all basically I wanted to say. And this is it. We're, we're running out of time, so we should really give the floor to Marina. Okay, Xavier, Marina, you're welcome. You have the floor. Hello, Marina. Good afternoon. Good evening, rather. Hi, Xavier. Thank you for coming here. We're really grateful. We had uh, tried in the past. Uh, we didn't manage to meet before. Thank you to the audience. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. We finished the Tucats de Lletras, Touched by the Letters uh, cycle. For those who have been attending it, we are really pleased to celebrate the Cosmographer cycle, which we've celebrated for the last five years. This festival of thought, it's always complex in a way, and five years um, have some sort of tradition or mean some sort of tradition. And uh, Manresa, it's a great city indeed. I'd also like to thank, before I shall introduce you uh, Marina's profile, and also I'd like to thank the culture uh, institution here at Manresa, Manresa City Council, because without this will, again, this uh, conference today it wouldn't have been possible. As you can see, we will have many great speakers today uh, from uh, Ca Catalonia, Spain, and also uh, some other international profiles. Let's talk about Marina. I'm sure you will realize that uh, we don't need much to say about her, because for those of you who um, love uh, literature and uh, essays, uh, well, you probably understand that she's very present uh, online. She works at the, the Open University, the UOC, and she organizes a master called Philosophy for Contemporary Challenges. If you're interested, there is a video online which is actually introduced by her, and it's a wonderful one. I do recommend it, and I was watching it, and one of the topics I learned from it, also from reading her, wor her work, I can state that she's multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. It's not only about thinking philosophy, but she thinks in a very transversal from uh, history of art, science, uh, etc. And when we talk about philosophy, sometimes we talk about Western philosophy. And she also talks sometimes about the Latin American tradition, uh, actually in some of her works and also in the master's degree she deals about these topics. Also I'd like to mention that she's worked in a myriad of projects. Uh, she's always tried. Uh, in philosophy normally we talk about being interested by the critical thought, but she's also actually tried to support um, 
projects that deal with critical thinking, but also with commit commitment and action. Tolstoy said that formulating philosophical principles is very easy, but actually materializing or making one or putting it into practice, it's really hard. Marina has tried, maybe she'll manage or she won't, but she's actually committed uh, to many projects. You will see in her CV, she's also shared some experiences we're talking about Glasgow these days and the will to transform this world. Regarding her works published, I will mention just a few. She's actually published um, loads prisons of the possible uh, unfinished uh, philosophy. Uh, this is one of her books that uh, deals a lot about uh, the, the criticism on how the university system works right now and she does a very profound analysis as to towards where the university should be looking into uh, also she revises some western philosophy as to what sort of tools do we need and and how we want to or how we should really think uh, in this regard. There's also another short, uh, tiny book, which is amazing, A New Radical Enlightenment. And one of the topics also I'd like to talk about, I can see some colleagues from the Meandre Association, the Ecologist Association here in Manresa. In this tiny book, she talks about posthumous uh, days in the sense that everything's almost finished or coming to an end as in a posthumous fact or entity. What we're doing now doesn't have any sort of continuity. She reflects on these sort of uh, items, this fact, and she talks about the Enlightenment uh, the first enlightenment was uh, an amazing radical change to the old regime and now she suggests a new change if we want to continue living as humans and at the same time living in harmony with nature and our habitat, be it global, social. It's a really recommended, uh, a book I, I truly recommend. Um, another autobiography uh, talks about some sort of project she dealt with in Barcelona and it's a sort of memoir, personal and collective memoir, memoirs because she talks about some experiences in Barcelona that we feel sort of uh, and, and have also shared uh, for those of us who are uh, above 50 or 60. And uh, there is another one uh, talking uh, about education and um, uh, it was titled Fora da Classe. Uh, the other ones we mentioned, the original ones are En las prisiones de lo posible, Un mundo común, El compromis, Filosofía inacabada, and uh, Nova Ilustración Radical. These are the original titles. Um, I would love to read her articles one after another. I mentioned the series of articles she published in ARA, in the newspaper. Uh, also like Xavier Antic's book, it was titled Fora de Clase, Outside the Classroom. And this is a novel that you can read article after us, article, it's really, really recommendable. Regarding her um, work with CCCB, as they publish their congresses, uh, there is a couple that can be uh, compromised and um, another one. And the moderator said, that today's title is to educate in order to think. And as Manresa is somehow still a little town, 
Uh, someone asked me why why don't you actually give this title and for those of us who actually work uh, within the philosophy Kant actually uh, said in his piece what is enlightenment a sentence that has become quite famous is sapere aude through uh, learning or through knowing it says dare not to know so uh, I leave this door open so that we can uh, we can ask her many questions. Actually, the opposite, as Kant's uh, shout to was the Enlightenment uh, when he said, "Don't wait for them to think for you. It should be you. Be mature. Be autonomous." I'll finish with two more ideas. She poses a question: How can we educate? She says, how to educate is a vertical question, it's unidimensional, and we often pose this question to ourselves because we're fearful. This is a true, the truly question we should ask ourselves. And this one is, how do we want to be educated? That comes first. And um, according to Marina's position, it's rather how we should educate that's got to do with education methodology but the actual deep down question talking about this educational reform for the high secondary educational system it should rather be how do we want to be educated and i finish as a teacher I totally agree with Marina when she also says, I don't believe in the school myth, myth, she says, as salvation for all the single uh, problems because school itself cannot achieve anything. And I've actually suffered this myself. Teachers, professors, we're always the guilty ones, right? These boys should learn about sexual relationships. We should, they should learn about uh, traffic regulations. Okay, the school will do it too. They need to learn about this and that. Always the school is the one. Well, we cannot solve every single problem and um, evils of the world. So, Marina, you have the floor. Thank you, Xavier, for this wonderful introduction uh, into the context. And I actually feel within this uh, meeting, thank you very much to all of you uh, for being here. Thank you for the organizers of Cosmograph at this session. It's true that we had tried several times and well, COVID didn't allow us. Um, with my sort of agenda problems and, and this pandemic, well, this time, yes, we've managed to meet here in Manresa. For me, it's a great pleasure. Xavier, with your presentation, you've left me many sort of open doors, so I hope we will be able to talk uh, maybe later. And uh, this cycle of conferences is wonderful. I feel envy because you have great speakers coming very soon this month, so excellent. Well, today I would like to talk about the alliance of learners in the School of Learners in this book, and I'll mention why. It's, it's rather than a, a concept of um, a role or a figure, there's some sort of philosophy that defends that it's worth learning through images or figures, we will talk about it and we will see whether we can think ourselves today, be in whatever or whichever position we are in the educational system. Maybe we've left behind the formation or the, the training or education system we had in the past. Or even if we, we are not part, we can be learners amongst learners as parts, as part of society and as beings who uh, live or cohabit ones with the others. What can we learn uh, from one another? Maybe this is the base of a, a coexistence and a social transformation.
formative practice and up to which extent this condition of learners, if it's sort of ours, it could be an alliance. We could actually forge, forge alliances. I'd like to reflect on that. But before that, I'd suggest to quickly revise and, and uh, travel to Italy. I'm sure uh, I'll be talking to you about some figures that you will know in your homes, uh, schools, etc. Let's go back to the beginning of the fascist Italy when Mussolini was filing, you know, and demonstrating in Rome and other Italian cities with his dictatorial magnificence. One of my favorite uh, films, Eto Scholars Una Giornata Particolare in English, a special day, it uh, shows a working class family in a city, sort of poor neighborhood, uh, and the family is getting ready, you know, dressing up the kids so that they can be seen amongst the masses welcoming the dictator. And the husband wears all his uh, best clothes, uh, his medals, and she stays at home tidying up and making the beds uh, once they leave. Uh, to, to welcome Mussolini. She's Sofia Loren. She starts talking to a neighbor who's fearful because fascism is uh, penetrating, is accessing in Italy. And after this special day that these two characters share, and I will not make a spoiler, uh, I hope you can enjoy it. It comes to a specific time when Sofia Loren says, an illiterate woman can be suffering anything or anyone can do anything to an illiterate woman. And this unknown person, this neighbor who actually gets into her place, well, they start talking about her miseries as a working class woman with a patriarchal uh, husband, we see she is not allowed to to leave uh, uh, the house. She needs to stay in to tidy up the house, continue with the chores and prepare the meal. And she doesn't have tools to change her own position uh, within her family, society, and with regard to her own expectations. And this neighbor, well, she's telling him that uh, his uh, husband has many lovers and he keeps going out and she doesn't really uh, bother, it doesn't bother her much, but his current lover, and this really hurts her deeply, is a teacher, this other woman, and she writes him letters. And this is the point, uh, again, uh, she doesn't mind, she actually even prefers uh, her husband to go with other women, but the fact, this condition that this other woman is a teacher, and the fact that she's seen the letters, uh, the fact that I wouldn't be able, I couldn't write letters, so this humiliation is becomes material. It, it's a profound uh, violation in the sense that anyone can do anything to an illiterate woman. And again, I link to another Italian scene that I also mention in the book. I watch it in a 30 minutes, 30 minutes documentary, the youngest men or boys belonging to the Napoli mafia gangs, as it's happened to in other areas in Brazil or etc. It's happened that they're really, really young and all the programs that are supported and launched from the social services and educational system to try to rescue them from, from the mafia and, and help them have a, a better life. You can maybe watch it online. You can see in this documentary the all these, these programs and at a specific time, one of these boys, uh, you can see a teacher showing them some, some stuff and he holds his head and says, we don't have brains. 
in the sense of okay everything you're telling me is okay but the the, the evil is already there we cannot he's not criticizing the system he's not getting upset he's actually sort of uh, accepting the defeat he's resigned and when I watched this scene, I thought, how many boys and girls, maybe not from such a radical context, not within the mafia, but how many sort of normal boys might think, I don't give a damn, I don't bother. There are some teachers who might even say, don't even care. There's this auto or self-conscious of of this resigned attitude again i link with sofia loren who still gets angry because if she had studied this would happen to her she would be able if she had studied she would be able to write love letters if she had studied maybe she would have been a teacher or any any other nice uh, profession so she's frustrated maybe she cannot change her position uh, actually many women then uh, we will talk about that later but they actually many women uh, changed uh, uh, broke these chains of uh, there's pain there's suffering however in this young sicilian boy there's this self-conscious and this irreparable uh, damage I believe this is the most serious problem when we talk today about learners, about education, about ourselves. And can we really change things? This resi resignation is really deep down. It's sort of running in our blood. Um, maybe we have all accepted this resignation i want to talk about all this i would like to reflect about these two characters how can we be more sofia loren than this boy who's given up and how can we recover this feeling of rage and frustration so that we can change it and I believe this has to do with time this is the reflection I would like to do today with you somehow Sofia Loren while Mussolini is marching through Rome in this position of political defeat of um, and some other options that they were fighting then, not only communism, she is part of this conflict dispute moment, uh, this moment that we'll see the Second World War. There's a dispute regarding the present and the future, who will write this near coming future, which women will be able to write this future and who will be left behind i've got the sensation that today we're living the catastrophe of time uh, it's actually svetlana alexevich uh, term uh, who coined this expression when she talks about Cherno chernobyl she says it's not a nuclear uh, accident it's a ca catastrophe of time it's all these facts which sort of disassemble the three dimensions of time because the future is unknown we're talking about this the the no future of the youngsters and the no future of the planet and the no future of we don't know who uh, it's this postmum condition that xavier mentioned it's the acceptance of the fact that there is no life at present as the mafia young man said so this future is disattached from us and comes back as a menace it could be a planet uh, the cop 26 and glasgow we were being bombarded by all these catastrophic uh, situations and they're saying that it's christmas around the corner and we should all dash to buy plenty of supermarket goodies 
everything seen as a menace, we will not have presents, you will not be able to make your kids happy uh, during Christmas. So, and working about, uh, the, the talking about the labor, the youngsters will not be able to work or buy a house. So these menaces are how we are experiencing this catastrophe of time and the present. What are we doing here in this conference, in this space, is presented as we can hardly link it to the future conferences. We're doing this to change things or to change ourselves so that we can learn to say things and to deal with things and our work, our links, our love, our projects in a different manner. This is this attached to, so this present is a present that uh, says, well, okay, I'm okay here, maybe I can live in my house, I don't know whether I'll be pay my, be paying my mortgage to my, to, tomorrow. So this still, I can still do that, I can still enjoy that, I can still pay my bills. It's a defensive present. There are some voices who are uh, sort of easier uh, still but some social uh, groups, uh, youngsters, some elderly people, there are some who are still in a better situation, is a contemporary inequality situation. So the youngsters, when they express uh, their uh, discontentment with the pandemic, it was far beyond the pandemic. The ones of you working uh, in secondary schools or with adolescent kids, you will understand that sometimes it's an ill or a painful shout or voice that wants to change this present that is deducting things. When you keep saying, we can still save some species, we can st still save or buy some furniture, we can still pay some, some bills. It's this idea. In this time catastrophe, what happens with the past? If the future is disattached and becomes a menace, if the present is deducting, we can still be here, we can still do this. What do we do regarding the past? It could be memory, it could be tradition, legacy, knowledge, modus vivendi, but also it's living elements of our lives. We speak the languages we speak because we are daughters or sons of mi uh, millinery stories. We have been changing these stories because we have changed. And think about how today in many educational contexts we talk about the traditional education as if uh, education has a past. Of course, it has a past because we do learn something from one another and we transmit, we express uh, things. But also we transmit content, uh, thought, knowledge. We convey things that belong to others others in the past, and it's not making past as an object of study, but it's about linking what we live today to elements that constitute us and make us what we are and that allow us to transform. We'd be empty, we'd be void elements that can either work or, or not, but we wouldn't have anything to link, to transform, to change. If we don't come from somewhere, we cannot go anywhere from a materialistic uh, sense. We are made of elements in the pre-Socrates uh, sense of the term. So this is why this past is sort of uh, too heavy in the sense that we learn uh, things, uh, it's wasting our time. If we learn Latin or Greek, is uh, wasting our time. Why do we need to do this if we're wasting our time in this time that um, deducts uh, from us or becomes a menace? 
And this is really serious. And this idea has actually entered our schools. Uh, the idea of we cannot waste our times with things from the past. Uh, if I think about uh, even paintings in the caves, in the prehistoric caves, is, is it could be something not from the past, but actually present if we can learn from it. So who tells us whether something only belongs to the past and uh, is uh, is only actually something that means a ballast and impedes us to be agile uh, because we're supposed to be agile constantly. So past, present and future are problematic right now. And this is a crisis when we talk about education and I actually hate the term crisis. I will not ever use it again if I can because it's the word that actually is used to say nothing because if everything is in crisis you know when we have done uh, the crisis our normality the everyday life is to accumulate crisis then it's not the new normal uh, actually having some trouble is not synonym of being in a permanent uh, continuous crisis before Xavier mentioned this famous sentence by Kant uh, actually he was inspired by Horace the fact of thinking through yourself is the main slogan of enlightenment thinking in an autonomous uh, manner but Kant was also known uh, thanks to the three important questions. What can I know? What can I do? What can I wait or expect? These are the three questions that organize the criticism of reason towards knowledge and the question regarding the horizon what can we know, what can we do, what can we expect, i.e. what sort of validity can this knowledge that we find everywhere in the past, we don't know do what to do about, and futures that are menacing, what can we do, i.e. the validity of the moral element and the, the political action, we can make or do many things, but we are living in a hyperactive mode uh, what lacks as is action we are all hyperactive uh, during this pandemic we had forgotten a little about it but now we're back uh, over again and we are living in a chaotic uh, manner always running like headless chickens it's not about making or doing many things but mm, doing whatever is effective, is valid, and what can we expect? This youngster from Sicily, and again, Sofia Loren expected something, something that had been stolen from her. She felt that she couldn't access, but the, this, the, the Italian boy, he doesn't expect anything, he doesn't wait for anything in, in his future. It's not about having hope or feeling hope in a theological uh, manner there's people who's optimistic or pessimistic people hoping but no it's relating what we do with a time that is not finished something that does not finish here and now it's not about linking a course after another, a work after another, a house after another, an action after another. This is pointless. It makes no sense. It has no direction. Is this immediate continuum present in this time that uh, deducts from us? Regarding what we can know, what we can do and wait or expect i think yes we can pose ourselves our questions but we need to know who we are asking these questions to in an authoritarian 
context, they could be directed to an educational authority, a politician or family authority, who would be the person with the power to tell us what we can know, do and expect, i.e. the limits of our future. So these questions are not good per se if they are not located in a specific context because we could be actually uh, sort of asking permission to live. We are sort of uh, asking permission to exist. What do, what do you let me know? What do you allow me to, to, uh, to know or to expect? So we need to devoid to escape this sort of uh, position. So turning around these questions, uh, Xavier before um, mentioned Escola de Prenens, this school of learners, it should be a question not um, a question making us learn from one another. It's not about this submissive question or this recognition of authority. It's about forging uh, an alliance amongst equals, amongst peers. This is the basis for me to establish this present and future emancipatory pedagogies. So these questions do not ask about the existing limits of the knowledge, action and future, but they can become these questions so that this alliance of learners, these questions can help us erase the ones who impose on us. I think education is an art on setting limits, not in the sense, in the authoritarian sense of imposing limits, rather than those limits that we can find and share. I mean, there is nothing more, uh, for example, before we said, is the, is the school alone or not? What does a school draw? Well, a, a space and time, which it could be in the middle of a forest, like uh, some forestry schools, actually, where there's no doors, windows, uh, etc. But above all, the school draws this invitation for us to meet, uh, be it children, if it's compulsory or not, be it adults, for many reasons why we are self-invited to share some time and, spa and space around some learning. That's a school. We can imagine it in the street, in a forest, whatever. So it, it sets some limits as a scene in a theater. We don't need to build a theater, of course, but where can we find a theater? Anywhere where someone can draw this limit amongst the person who is applauding, laughing, watching or whistling. So the theater has begun because we do have a limit. This concept of limit creates world, creates links, alliances amongst the audience and the actors, the students and teachers, the learners, etc. If we have no limits, this time doesn't work. It's a sort of catastrophe. And today we use a term that I dislike and we keep repeating is uncertainty. Everything's uncertain. We talk about uncertain times all the time. This sentence that says it's here to stay uh, about the pandemic. Well, I'm living. If the pandemic's here to stay, I'll, I'll be living, right? It seems that uncertainty is also here to stay. And what does uncertainty say? Is the no limit regarding what we can know, uh, do or expect. It erases uh, what we can do. All that allows us to do is to prepare ourselves, the students, the children better for what? To have those tools empty 
agile, effective and quick tools to respond to what? To uncertainty. To these uncertain times that make from these past, present and future unlinked moments and the only possible action is to adapt to change. If you think about your work, um, territorial issues, etc. Constantly we are being told messages and things as if this was positive, as these were uh, something nice, like you will not have your work uh, forever, you will need to reinvent yourself, yourself through lifelong learning. Well, we've learned, we know already that this message is quite dangerous. It's not a liberty message, it's rather a menace. This slogan means that you will not take a rest, uh, never, ever, under this promise of change. So this uncertainty models or shapes this uh, type of education that doesn't work with limit, which doesn't generate these shared limits, which does not position us in space and time with others, but it pushes us to be farther uh, away, farther away, away, away. So we can also use this term that is used currently is the potential. How often have you heard the word potential? Well, you say potential, what does it mean to have potential? You can have many things, capacity, interests, wishes, uh, mistakes, relations, knowledge, questions, I don't know, experience lack of experience, I mean, how many elements make us capable of do something or learn how to do something? This potential is, or has to do with investment, valorization, is a capitalist, is a tautology uh, element, this circular element that keeps inviting us to keep running like a hamster on the wheel all the time. So if something has no potential, it loses value, like the stock exchange or the real estate. And today, lives are forced to work in this manner. So there's nothing that grows, that actually grows or uh, flourishes, because we are forced to keep active our potential. And what's the other side of the coin? not having potential. And what happens then? Well, you hold your head and you say like the Italian boy, we have no brains. So being self-conscious and saying today that or admitting that your life will not be valued, you will not have potential, you are sort of uh, waste in a in a way it's it's i can talk about zygmunt bauman when he talked about residual lives or wasted lives i think uh, this idea of garbage or waste or something that society doesn't want the non-recyclable element so, uh, this, this, this book, yes, by Sigmund Bauman, Wasted Lives, Modernity and Its Outcasts, talks about the education of potential, which doesn't work with time, but rather pushes us to walk uh, sort of against time. I'd say that this framework, this scene from these two characters, helped us understand this Sofia Loren actually feeling angry and admitting her sort of waste position. Uh, what shows us is this broken mirror of emancipation. It means that there's a mirror 
like uh, in Marseille, Rudureda's uh, mirror, we can see our image reflected, but it's broken. And what does it mean, this mirror of emancipation? What do we talk about when we, I believe, today, it's not this present, this uh, um, deducting or deducing present, it's about defending the emancipatory nature of education. Yesterday, I was chatting with some friends, telling them that I'd be here today, and a friend of mine, a professor uh, who works at the Barceloneta Secondary School, he's quite young, he said, actually, yes, knowledge emancipates and this is my work plan uh, of this year and in the future if i still work here next year for the uh, barceloneta high school and he kept talking about this emancipatory nature of knowledge but our everyday experience tells us that it's not the case we know many things, but all these expectations are disassembled and are not translated into proper action. There are some state secrets in this country and there are corporate secrets. There are many types of secrets, but in general, access to knowledge is quite broad. We cannot, none of us actually can have a reflexive and, and comprehensive uh, knowledge of everything. The door has been open and for us, and even the fake news, these alternative realities, all of us, if we devoted some time, we all have the time of uh, actually double checking and reading the right sources. The problem is about knowing or not knowing, rather, what do we do about this knowledge? How do we relate about this knowledge so that we create positive experiences? This is the best action education can do, can manage today. This relationship between space and time, these limits that are not imposed, we decide how to set them. So, what do we do with our time? Can we create a possible experience which is positive? This is the key. This defines emancipation. How can we think them? As Kant said, think uh, yourself without the help of anyone else. He was pointing towards this direction under some conditions. But that's what he meant. It's not about having tons of knowledge, pieces of information. They do nothing. It's about thinking or thinking from them or with them. Let's think about how many, uh, how often uh, we say what we do, what we know, the sort of work or even the culture we consume. We don't even have to think. Sorry, we don't even have time to think it or rethink it. The moment of knowing and, and consuming is also um, not linked. We consume or we do more things that we can rethink. And often I share with some other professors and teachers the person has knowledge and experience, etc. And the main uh, sort of complaint, like, like Sofia Loren, is I have no time to, I just act. I have no time to think what I do. So emancipation should be think what you do or think what you do or think with the others. This is the first key element. It will only be possible with this forged alliance between learners because you cannot open this space to think yourself if it's not in relation with others. And the other side of the coin of this emancipatory condition of learning is 
the fact that what we learn that pieces those pieces of information should allow us to intervene i mean being able to question them uh, transform them think them uh, criticize them manipulate them and they should have consequences in our lives we should not only gobble or consume them so thought and transformation i'm not saying anything that we haven't said a thousand times in the past but it seems to be a sort of forgotten idea these days this knowledge which doesn't allow us to have the possibility to intervene, to change the living conditions of our world, our present, are sterilized, useless knowledge. And this is why they leave them to us, because if they're left there, uh, we can do nothing about it. What is the challenge? We should be able to do something with this knowledge. We should not only digest it or keep it or have it. We should be able to transform our context, our lives. This is the alliance. And this is the alliance of the learners. And with this idea, I finish. This is not an educational model. There are many. Uh, we've had, we've seen many in the past. We will see some in the future. There are no, um, um, there's no magic wand in the pedagogy or the educational world. But someone who can really love, think, and education, the gurus lead, uh, just sell formulas. We don't need formulas. We need sense. Uh, to me, the alliance of the learners is not a model, it's not a formula, it's not a single methodology. It's rather a figure from where we can uh, meet or, or re-meet, uh, meet again. It's uh, an invitation to become learners amongst other learning, ner learners and to forge this compromise with thought and with this transformation of society. So I believe the order, the, the, the word order of the title is correct. It's not about learning how to think. That's, that's silly. You can't say, show me how to think uh, properly. You can only uh, do it by thinking, uh, practicing this relationship between what we know or what we don't know. This is the learning process and this is, again, the limits moving amongst what we know and what we don't know without these limits being an abyss or a border or a cliff. If we know how to support ourselves in this relationship between what we know and what we don't know is where uh, learning actually becomes meaningful, what uh, where we can uh, transform these limits. And this is where I live it. I hope we shall have time to reflect something and we hope that these future alliances will help us think this coming month. Thank you very much. Okay, we shall open the Q&A, the question and answer session. Please feel welcome to pose any questions. Surely you will be interested. Okay, we have someone interested over there. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Marina, for being here. I believe uh, we were trying, we've been trying for years, actually, uh, Ms. Garces. Personally, I have read all of your works, all of your essays, and I understand uh, that your vision is very bright and very clear, like Albert Lladó said. It's very lucid. I was in Hyde Park 
and the speaker's corner it was uh, sort of defined as a model of democracy there was a little stool where people could actually stand up and talk and and give speeches when i was there 40 years ago i thought it was great because there was a single man uh, with two or three people listening and it struck my attention because it somehow think that this lucid wonderful message could be lost as it happened to that man in the speaker's corner how can we translate all these to actually transform um, i don't know whether i'm being too too daring but if you have an idea i'd love to hear hear about it well i would answer actually uh, from the other perspective, I mean, in my case, and I guess many of the people who try to use the word as a messenger, uh, we don't know each other, but we've been able to uh, share our words through novels or this event or YouTube, whatever. For those of us who reflect and uh, use this course, maybe Speaker's Corner or in a conference or in a book, I believe it makes sense what we do if we add to the word uh, wishes, uh, ideas, reflections, that we take from reality and we translate it, we take it towards this alliance, alliance amongst unknown persons. I believe this philosophy sometimes talks about specific examples, not always, but I believe that when I talk about the alliance of learners, it's not something that I've made up. It's it's a phenomenon that happens everywhere. Any good teacher or professor has always taught this way. Any single good professor or teacher is forging an alliance with his or her students. Actually, coining terms or putting words to concepts uh, these days with all this bombardment of uh, things like everything's uncertain or mock sentences, you know, um, it's not true that everything's uncertain, but we also have clear convictions. Not everything's uncertain. I believe that this work with words, language, how we express ourselves, what sort of use, uh, words we use, uh, what sort of experiences are not just a defensive reaction of, oh, well, let's give an opportunity, still an opportunity to these boys. This is a loser position. Let's rephrase things. Let, let's rename realities. Today, for example, I was thinking about my notes and I said to myself, why there is places like La Scola, the school, Linda, Second Opportunity School, or Chamfra, who are choosing names that are related to a limit. The Chamfra means in Catalan the corner, the, the, the street corner, so it's a somehow a spatial limit and this uh, Linda also the same thing. I, I know these projects, I've worked with them, but there are many other examples. And they are, this threshold was the other one, is where the alliance of learners can change this social uh, attitude, negative attitude towards uh, these learners who have the second opportunity so that we don't condemn these uh, students. So we have many true uh, elements in our reality not to 
by and not to be um, sort of uh, becoming or assuming this loser attitude or this time we are uh, losing or, or wasting. Uh, this implies the cost of compromise and effort. It's not a cheap illusion. But it happens. We are constantly receiving the message of empty shelves in supermarkets, for example. This media fearing or causing us fear for the coming Christmas. What does it mean? Are we the empty shelves? Are we becoming empty shelves where you can put anything you want? No. Well, what do we want to be filled with in these empty shelves? This is basically the idea. Any other questions? <laughs> questions or comments, feel free. Anecdotes, reflections, films. <laughs> For those of us who have been working in the educational system, well, sometimes you think that young students who are learning and who are in front of you, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to try for them to reach university, but sometimes your the way you express yourself is unique and who is it referred or directed to for those going beyond is it true that it's really hard for them to keep learning or to find a motivation to have students who are to, who feel motivated towards or in tune towards what you want to explain or teach them. So it's really hard. You have 30 people in front of you with their own past, their own experience, anecdotes, potential, etc. So, how do you position yourself in this myriad of elements? This is one of my reflections. It's a major difficulty. This learning together. Of course, you learn an awful lot when you teach. But sometimes you wonder who you have reached, where, or how could you have done even more, or who have I left behind. I understand the sense of your reflection, but this is why I decided to write this book and the first one who actually wonders or I don't try to give any recipes. It's actually been written uh, at a time that things are happening in a rush manner and are affecting the basic pillars of education. I question myself, what am I doing here in front of these 30 young students looking at me uh, saying, well, don't make any effort. Everyone has 
uh, his or her answer. I actually include uh, a letter I once sent to my students when I taught at the University of Zaragoza. I used to live in Barcelona. I've done that for 15 years. I drove uh, three hours or took the train and I actually spent many nights uh, away from home, so I were students of philosophy and we are sharing this feeling of what do we do here when they came in and they sat, you know, quite tired or, or not bothering really. And again, this analysis of time, of this here and now, where are we looking into what is our direction? We don't know how to think it. We don't know. It's really hard for us. I don't want what you expect from us. The, the youngster rebellion it could be a, a dispute for the future we don't want this future but now the youngsters cannot state that they they say you've stolen our future and it changes a lot give them tools in order to to think this is interesting it's worth it's a way to anticipate wrong or bad solutions. As no one knows what to do, then comes the apparently effective response. Quick methodologies. Let's change rooms, distract them, plenty of technology, and managing time and emotions, which allows them nothing to happen hey we need to look into each other's eyes in the letter i asked them why are you here but not actually criticizing them in the sense of how do we make from this time not a menace from one another but a starting point and how can we do it not to cover it now it's very easy to distract we live under this 24-7 uh, distraction everything needs to be faster and, and quicker and we don't pay each other's attention Maybe I'm naive, but I always think that it's always nice to do this detour. I mean, give each other the time, space, tools and words to think what we do and not to rather find the first solution available. The capitalism understands clearly that education and culture are the battlefield of our time. Why this disembarkment, this invasive, free, easy disembarkment of concepts, technologies, tools. It's not only technology, this is a way of uh, interrelating. What are we saying? Don't waste your time, don't lose your time. This is a slogan. And it's giving this message to many students, sharing time is wasting time. Don't go with these who are slower, don't go, don't go with those who don't speak your language, etc. We are uh, the Google School, uh, it's a simplistic idea, means you try your own adventure, as uh, the books we read when we were small if you're faster why should you carry with the others students the one who didn't study the one who has problems the one who comes from another country etc i think that stopping and thinking about all this will help us see all these things that seem to be immediate but we in this sort of rush time constantly uh, they will pass by in front of our eyes and will not notice we need to stop think and see what's going on any other comments questions what you mentioned about technology is 
really interesting because I'm still in touch with some high schools and with telework and, and studying from home. Well, what do they miss? Of course, they don't want to go back to, to the high school. It's a fact of not wanting to go there. It's the idea of sharing, uh, because when they're at home, they cannot share with others. Of course, if you have uh, your laptop, you can continue with your studies, but what's necessary is this human touch and relationship with your teacher, your colleagues, your this social element of sharing. And something I thought was really interesting, apart from the learning uh, element, I will pose you questions. Uh, you mentioned something that is something interesting. Many students, uh, apart from the question, what do you do here? Uh, or what, what the heck am I doing here, rather? That's the question I pose myself. Let's talk about it, you know? You mentioned this idea, and you, I know you don't like the word crisis. Well, sometimes I use it, but now they talk about climate change all the time, and I think that a problem that we feel, the elderly, is that time dimensions have been broken. Past, the past currently doesn't exist because we cannot link it to the present. So all of us live the present nature of the present rather than instant. We should rather talk about life news, instant actions, everything's fast. So we have no perspective, no image of this present. You talk about why, what's, if we don't know how to live, what's worth knowing or why should we know? Students actually say that all the time. This, what we are learning here, will it be useful for me in the future? Imagine, I don't know what, what to say. Sometimes I used to say, maybe it will be more useful for you to learn art or poetry, but this technological element, because in two years' time, it will be obsolete. Maybe art and poetry will help you to live. I used to tell them, or philosophy, they say it's not useful, but maybe in a few years' time you will remember that saying, that sentence, and that idea, you might actually use it or put it into practice in your life. But it's not only my students, my adolescents, maybe they're even more lost. It actually happens to us too. And another question you ask yourself, and I believe an adolescent really suffers it, why should we learn when I'm incapable of imagining my future? I'm incapable of saying uh, in a utilitarist manner, why or how am I going to use this information tomorrow? So this rupture of time, how do you interpret it? Yes, it's the pillar of the reflection I wanted to share with you because it seems it's all about a crisis converted into a biblical uh, sort of curse and we can only become elements that save us, like school as the savior of society, or, or us professors as saviors, uh, rescuing students, uh, helping uh, people trying to cross the borders or come into Europe. Again, what you mentioned about the students being left behind and some of the things that we've mentioned, on the one hand, all these messages about uncertainty. The other day we mentioned, uh, it was a title in one of the main newspapers, it was quite surreal. If it were a, a novel or something, it said 80 or 80 odd percent of works uh, in the next five or ten years. 
are currently unknown. And how have you been able to count them to define its 80%? Are they really unknown? I mean, you read these and it's shocking. You can be a young, you can have a precarious job. Any of us receive this fear message. Where should I go to or look into which direction? It was uh, amazing. We could actually devote a, a training, a teaching uh, session. How do we build these discourses? If we analyze this discourse, we could all do it. And why do we read it as something that is announced or descript descriptive of reality? Is ideological? And it's actually a war against time that clearly is being uh, fought with this type of words, destruction of the planet, uh, climate crisis or climate change. The climate does enter or access a crisis. We're talking about pollution, uh, global warming. These are actions, not events. How do we talk about facts? Then we will be able to imagine. But if facts become actions, like 80% of works changing or being unknown, or the planet being destroyed, because it is in the process of being destroyed, well, I think that today this dispute around language and wording realities is fundamental. So education is very basic. Why do we say this? Why do we choose this word? Why do we believe this is natural language or not? There are many ways of manipulating uh, reality. So it's a way of, of distorting the future. It becomes dark. And this is my suggestion at the end of, the, of this novel, of this essay. This, Im this, imagine, this imagination of this dark future. No, we should think about this menacing present that interpeals or, or um, asks us to reflect and, and think. We should really stop and say, why is this title, this newspaper, writing this uh, silly idea? This is what I mean. It's a specific possibility, the fact of stopping and relearning how to read, so that um, now that all of us the ones that um, the ones of us who can read I wonder whether we can question ourselves if we can generate sense from the images, the words, sensations that we receive, that we are bombarded constantly with. And quite serious, this ideological, rhythmic machinery, this time, this sensation of breaking constantly, all this continuity, there's people thinking behind, this doesn't happen by chance, there are department, academic departments, think tanks, corporations, political groups, mediatic groups, etc. There's tons of science, knowledge, theory and plenty of position of uh, making, uh, transmitting information and making us slaves of uncertainty, servants, this adaptative servant attitude, just waiting, waiting for what? Waiting to adapt to something is unknown? 
This is a form of making subordination, making people subordinate. And I believe that a good education is re receiving the tools so that we can uh, why do we say what we say? Why does this happen, etc.? We can open these uh, thresholds that I mentioned before, these limits that are not just a cliff or an abyss. Any more comments? Reflections? You're welcome. Yeah, at the end of the room. Can you hear me? I'd like to mention that there's been a sort of eclosion of this top, these topics in series and cinemas. And I'd like to add on that uh, there are several like Black Mirror collapse or others, and this dystopia does not allow us to see other models. Uh, even the hippie sort of thinking about dystopia. I'd like to add, basically, it's a comment. Yeah, these observations really uh, interesting because it's the other side when we cannot imagine the future, we are offered these fantasies, this dystopian, uh, it's the no time, no place, it's something outside the, the space and time in the sense of historicity and what we do and the consequences. So they do this, uh, this make this leap by using this fantasy so that we can project ourselves towards these futures uh, these dystopian futures uh, where we can change or not wish or or reject and is presented to us as this unique uh, uh, space whether uh, we will be all cyborgs and we will live in Mars and chips will uh, make us uh, live forever, etc. And currently, this is the dominant aesthetics of the cultural industry. And why do we feel attracted to it? Why do we consume it eagerly? Well, at the end of the day, even apocalypse is uh, restful. If everything finishes, what do we do here? Well, we're waiting for the end to, to arrive. Uh, it releases us from being responsible to do something, right? Living, uh, suffering this stress all the time, thinking, oh my God, I, I still have 10 more years to live, or I still need to defend something, to do something, to earn something, etc. Well, it's somehow uh, joyful, even. Uh, it's somehow an enjoyable feeling. It's interesting to, to think about what sort of emotions does this uh, wake or generate in us and how do we position it, position, sorry, ourselves to, to reflect on that. Hi. Before we were talking about Sofia Loren and, and, and this scene, it's very interesting. And I'd like to mention again the Sicilian boy, because for a long time I taught in the prison and I've seen all sorts and met uh, loads of people, uh, people literally who do not know what a pencil is or who doesn't even know what a museum is and who has a certain, a certain interest to know what it is and to find more. But also you, also, you find other people who don't even want to think 
they reject, they don't have this will. It's a little more difficult. Someone even said to me that for sure when he would be released, he would uh, commit a crime again because he didn't know whatever. And I said, but what do you want to do? Even with a gun? Yes, if I need to, I'll, I'll, I'll have one. But are you going to kill someone? Well, no, but I'll, I'll have a gun. I'll wear a gun with me all the time. So with such groups, what can you do? How can you educate? How can you teach them if uh, there's people who really don't want to learn? The first case, well, he was somehow curious to to find out what the museum was. You could do something with him, but with this other second uh, prisoner, it's unfortunately quite common. So it's extremely hard. How can you manage? Yes, it's very numerous. It's common. I explained it as an extreme position of many adults, many youngsters who would never position ourselves in, in such a context, but the attitude's the same. You could have higher education, but you could still have this attitude of, no, why should I do it? Because in certain schools where people are rich enough, uh, not to need to do something or to make any further efforts. So these, they, they, they are inactive too. They have the same position as the prisoner. So this expectation, uh, when I talk about the social lift, we still understand that society is a skyscraper. We don't want uh, social lifts. We want a society where where everyone lives in a, with dignity. Uh, we don't want social lifts, obviously, or the time of the promise of education that sociologically and from the educational point of view, we came from certain political scenario and there is this social group who has been deplaced de de uh, in a positive way, but in some other countries this has not been the case. What can in such cases promise education? What can it promise you to become this immediacy of the social lift? The rich ones travel by private jet. Uh, this social elevator does exist, we are aware of that. But there are other possible senses of this expectation of this, what can I expect? What can I expect in life? It's, it's really hard to use words that can sound feasible or, or real that we can uh, believe. It's rather, what can I do that makes sense to you and to me here now? We should rephrase the sentence, not to leave the one without brain in the void. We're here, right? So what can we do with it? If you're here in the prison, you're telling me that when you go out, you're going to commit crimes again. For me, it's hard to believe. Uh, now I see it in adolescence that someone who doesn't know who he or she is, when does it happened the most important thing that it could happen to him. I'm not talking about Instagrams and stuff, but the, the, the regard is what an adolescent needs. The gaze, the glance, the look. We all knew it. So if someone looked into my eyes, it means I do exist. This look. 
it could be merchandised and be translated as a number of follow followers in social networks, but I'm talking about in my work about welcoming existence from this basic element, I'm here, we are here, what does it happen from here, what do we do from here now? These are very fundamental, very basic questions. Uh, there are no easy recipes. The ones, the gurus selling them are not being honest. Changing the sense of difficulty, yes, it can be achieved. And the sense of expectation today, um, the expectations that were promised to be offered, they don't exist anymore. So the question needs to be rephrased and the meeting point to Uh, do we have any more questions? Shall we call it a day? Okay, thank you very much, Marina. Thank you. Now that they show it.